I want to introduce you to a continent. It's not far from here. In fact, most of you are very familiar with it. This continent is a large piece of land, and it is at the center of most world maps. It is filled with millions of people who, to most outsiders, look a lot alike. The countries in it have borders that have been drawn and redrawn many times. In fact, much of the map looks very different today than it did a mere century ago. This continent has endured many tragedies, war, extreme poverty, famines, diseases that wiped out millions, and many violent turns of political fate. The continent I'm talking about, of course, is Europe. In the 20th century, Europe had over 183 recognized conflicts. Millions of Europeans died from famine, poverty, and disease. I named these tragedies to show you that we are more alike than we are different, and that narratives and complexities matter. I'm going to talk to you today about shared imaginations. The damage that failed imaginations have done, what stops us from being creative problem solvers, and what we can do to ensure that our collective future is shaped by minds that are free, empathetic, and able to picture possibilities wider than we could have ever imagined. A shared imagination is one in which a collection of people from different backgrounds who have different lived experiences, have different perspectives and ways of thinking, come together to create solutions collaboratively. The modern world is filled, unfortunately, with the singular genius narrative, the myth that it takes one strong mind to change the world. But the truth is that the shared imagination is behind some of society's greatest achievements. Technology, space travel, and political ideas continue to be driven by groups of people who had the courage and faith in each other to come together and answer the question, what if? According to the Mars Exploration Rover's update, no one builds a rocket or makes a discovery in space alone. Hundreds, sometimes thousands, of people may be involved in a single project. Only together can scientists and engineers do the work of NASA. Apple, often seen as the most innovative company in the US, held the most patents in 2010. And though the singular genius narrative is strong in that company's mythology, it is known by tech insiders to be one of the most horizontal and creative workplaces in the tech sector. And today we stand in the member state of the most tangible proofs of what a shared imagination can achieve. In the 20th century, nobody could imagine a Europe free of war, of strife, and in 2012, the European Union was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize because it had, for six decades, contributed to the advancement of peace and reconciliation, democracy and human rights in Europe. What I'm getting at is this, that it is only through a shared imagination that we can solve the most unsolvable problems. And we have never needed the power of a shared imagination more than we do now. Good afternoon. My name is Sianda Mohutsiwa. Um, I'm a writer, a mathematician, a former UN youth reporter, an associate professor at the University of Iowa, and a coordinator of the prestigious international writing program. At the age of 26, I have already cycled through many careers and will most likely continue to do that for the rest of my life. In 2019, it is crucial for me, like many millennials, to accrue a number of skills that will aid us in the economies in which we find ourselves. Economies that are quickly changing, unpredictable, and interconnected in ways that we may have never imagined. And this is why I believe that the world's most valuable skill is an ability to imagine the impossible. In a lot of ways, the world is vastly different than it was a mere 20 years ago. 
The internet has given people abilities and communication that were truly unthinkable. With the press of a button, entire industries were born. Communications, international finance, and entertainment were never the same again. Over the last 25 years, more than a billion people were lifted out of extreme poverty. And according to the World Bank, the, glo the global poverty rate is now lo lower than it's ever been in recorded history. In the past 20 years, Africa's total conflict intensity, as measured by the Center for Systematic Peace, fell by approximately half. An average of 32 people per 100,000 were killed per year in the 1980s. And today, that number has fallen to less than eight per 100,000. Though, of course, there's still some way to go. Africa is more peaceful than it ever has been in over 50 years. But in other ways, the world doesn't seem to have changed very much. I mean, today, um, nationalists have gained mainstream appeal, bringing into the lexicon races, imagery, and dangerous ideas that we thought we'd left behind in the 20th century. The international slave trade has returned to the shores of Africa, with reports of thousands of people being sh sold in open-air markets in North Africa. And America, which had amazed the world in 2008 by electing its first ever black president, finds itself face to face with the dark underbelly of its history. And the FBI reported that more than 7,100 hate crimes took place in 2017 alone. Indeed, we have seen extremism, religious fundamentalism, and big political shifts that nobody saw coming. I've said that the world is changing, but in many ways, doesn't it seem like history is repeating itself? But why? I mean, the obvious answer can be summed up in the following quote, a very famous quote, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. My theory is kind of like that, but a little different. I believe that while the world's problems are changing rapidly, it appears that our solutions are still the same. We are suffering from a failed imagination. As the world has evolved and progressed, the one thing that has not is our imaginations. Technology has expanded its frontiers, pushed the limits of possibility, and instead of thinking bigger and bolder, we have let our imagination stagnate and looked to old ways of thinking to fix our new problems. When economies get tight, we see the rise in xenophobic narratives. In the face of unemployment, politicians convince us that is the poor migrant who is stealing from us. And this I have found to be true in my own travels around the world. Whether I'm in Finland, South Africa, or Taiwan, when times get tough, people blame outsiders. When times get tough, women's rights, children's rights, the rights of people with disabilities are discarded, and in some cases, even blamed for society's decline. We are suffering all of us, deeply, from the effects of a failed imagination. But what causes this? Well, obviously, not obviously, but fear. Fear stoked by politicians, mass media, and general ignorance and misdirection is a great detriment to our imaginations. In moments of crisis, the mind searches desperately for simple answers. It clings to binaries. We think in either or ways, either you're with us or against us, either we prosper or we fall into destruction. Fear limits our choices, and without choices, there's little room for imagination. And more than anything, with fear, there is no trust, and without trust, there's no collaboration. Another thing that is happening, and is particularly sad to me is I feel that we have outsourced our imaginations. 
um, the work of creating and thinking seems to no longer belong to us. Tech companies have quite literally captured our attentions. Using tactics that were invented and perfected by gambling companies, these companies can now determine where and how we look for solutions. What we consider progress and who we believe to matter in the world. Through inscrutable algorithms, advertising, and a deeply irresponsible attitude to online radicalization, tech companies are making it harder and harder for us to allow our minds to run free and to run wild. And whatever is left of our imaginations, unfortunately, is fought for by populist politicians and mass media. But there is a solution. We can wrestle our imaginations back into our hands and solve the unsolvable and imagine the unimaginable and think the unthinkable and to dream beyond our wildest dreams. I started this speech with a little experiment with the example of Europe and Africa's place in our imagination, showing that we, when we think of war and poverty and strife, we think of Africa, to show that we too in here are victims sometimes of a failed imagination. How can you tell that you have a compromised imagination? Well, I think it's a little easier. How quickly do answers come to your mind? How simple are they? When you hear the word war, what continent comes to mind? When you hear the term freedom of choice, what nation's flag appears in your imagination? Leaning on simplicity, on binaries, is a symptom of an imagination that is in no position to think the unthinkable, to dream beyond its limits. The other reason I share the statistics I have about decline in conflict, reduction in global poverty, and so on, is because I need us all to realize something that's very important. And in order to realize this very, very important thing, we must let go of old ideas. I believe that it is Africa that will save the world. It is Africa that it can teach us to reach beyond the scope of our wildest imaginations. South African intellectual and freedom fighter Steve Biko believed that it is the African's task to give the future of civilization a human face. And I believe that when he said this, he was talking about Ubuntu, the African philosophy that says this, in order to be human, one must recognize the humanity of others. Yes, it's a circular kind of definition, but one I enjoy immensely, because it means this, if you do not treat others with humanity, your humanity disappears. And I think where we find ourselves in the world, in the face of futures that feel unknowable and predictable, with societies twisting themselves desperately to fit into a world that can only imagine systems that propagate injustice and inequality, we can only save ourselves by saving each other. By the year 2050, Africa's cities will double in population. It will be home to the youngest people on Earth. Then we will see that the economies that we have imagined, the cities built on exploitation and extraction, are untenable. They are hostile to humanity. The climate crisis is proof enough that civilization as the world has divined, founded this gas-guzzling metropolitans, these Rainforest-destroying industries and resource-holding hierarchies will spell the end of humanity. But in Africa, we have the resources to create something truly revolutionary. Young people who will be more connected and more educated than any group of young people in human history, who will have generations of wisdom behind them, and the energy and courage to imagine the unthinkable. We have the spirit of Ubuntu, of a future that is undefined, unrestricted by failed imaginations. We have to let go of the old Western myth of, of, the old myth of Western superi supremacy. It has destroyed what we think of, is possible. 
Africa, with over thousands of nations, histories, cultures, languages, customs, has so much to offer to the world. Sustainable civilization is one of them. We who have many cultural heritages that place the lives of animals on par with ours, who realize that responsible use of natural resources is crucial to our survival. We can teach the world to live in harmony with nature. We who have many styles of governments. Governance more diverse than even Western classes and government are aware of, can redefine leadership, citizenship, and what it means to be contributing members of society. So let us expand our minds and read the works of African writers, philosophers, intellectuals, historians, sociologists, architects. The Bikos, Achevas, Tiongos, Heads, Wainanas, Wangari, Maitais, Maracheras, Mutuas, and on and on and on. They have so much to teach us, about, teach us about what it means to be human. But to go where we have to go, we have to do something. We have to fight fear with empathy, wrestle back our, creati our creativity from corporate interests, from those who seek only to deepen their pockets with the blood and sweat and tears of the poor. We have today in this room leaders and thinkers and business people and educators an opportunity to build a world that is empathetic and warm, based on humanity and the shared imagination. Because the only way to rescue ourselves, ultimately, is to rescue each other. Thank you.